The DebConf 7 Lightning Talks. Uh, these are a series of very short five-minute talks uh, by people to give a better idea or introduce an idea to, the, to everyone here. Uh, so first up, we have Balloon Open Hardware Board and License, which will be followed by Why Tracker is Cooler Than Unsliced Cheese. So I'll hand over to Wookie and uh, we'll get going. Hello. I've gone a bit soggy. Um, right, I carefully written a 15 minute talk compressed from the 45 minute normal version. I've just been told I've got precisely five. So um, this is the short made up version. Um, Balloon is, uh, I got into open hardware because of the LARP project, TU Delft. Um, university. Uh, uh, open hardware is a highly overloaded term. People mean all sorts of things like FPGA designs, which are actually software that creates hardware. Um, I'm talking about actual designs you can make, like that thing there. So here's a real one in a box, very fancy. Uh, I don't really want to talk about the hardware itself per se. Uh, I'm more interested in uh, the licensing. Um, but I'll just mention this as I'm, as I'm here. Uh, so that's a relatively powerful ARM box. It's reasonably fast. You have useful amounts of RAM and memory. Um, and uh, you can see the, the little ring of pins around there. You get a choice of either a low-power CPLD or a higher-power FPGA. Engineers get very excited when you tell them there's a million gate FPGA on because um, there's a whole lot of wires going into that. And you can connect it to arbitrary inputs and do you know, live FFTs and analysis in hardware on whatever data you're getting in. So. Um, that lets you do neat stuff. Uh, and there's a standard bus on the back of this thing. So this isn't very useful on its own as a computer. It hasn't got any useful sockets. It's just got a load of FFCs. So you have to stick in like a second board like this with USB ports on or whatever special I.O. you need for your interesting project. That's how it's intended to be used. So for example, uh, I have here a uh, light writer. This is a Balloon 2 in here, in fact. So uh, the company that now pays me to do cool stuff makes these things. And uh, if I can get this to work. So uh, that one's French. Uh, um, they, so they make speech synthesizers for people who can't themselves. Um, there's a Linux box inside, and there's their own I/O to drive all the funky input devices they use for depending what sort of uh, input the user can use. Um, what else do I need to tell you? So uh, licensing. Uh, people have used all sorts of different licensing for hardware designs. The people who actually write software to make hardware can use standard software licenses. And there have been various, people got quite excited about open hardware around about 2000. Quite a lot of you have probably heard of the Simputer project in India, um, which was uh, a strong arm design, quite a lot like what's inside that light writer. And um, that was a lawyer written license, they called it the Simputer GPL, which uh, was intended to allow people to make similar designs and if they were enough like a Simputer they could call it a Simputer. Um, but then they had to pay the Simputer Foundation a quarter of a million dollars uh, to actually make them. So uh, that was partly successful. There were a few thousand sold, ab about the same number as have been sold of Balloon 2s, in fact, which is a lot less popular as a project. And that was uh, uh, done by a guy called Steve Wiseman, whose license was, you can make as many as you like, but you have to persuade me if you want to make any changes. Um, so what we've done is tried to formalize this a bit better for Balloon 3 with um, uh, having looked at all the various licenses we decided, of course, that we had to write our own. Um, the problem with hardware, unlike software, is that it's very expensive to copy. Um, the the SimTech guys explain to you why it costs serious money to make things. You spend a lot of money on prototypes. Uh, then they don't work, so you have to do it again. Uh, you spend a lot of money designing stuff. You know, even if all your time of expertise is free, there's still quite a lot of money to be spent on actual stuff. And of course, the copying cost, you know, you can't just, down, you can't, I can't give you a URL and you can all download a balloon to play with. Well, actually, with QEMU, you can kind of do that. But uh, So because of the copying costs, uh, and also because you sell people actual hardware, a whole load of new laws apply, like the Sale of Goods Act and the fact that you have to be able to send it back within seven days if you don't like it, and it has to be disposed of in a particular way, uh, and the uh, ROHS, uh, no, there isn't allowed to be any lead in it act, and so on. So we've tried to write a license which covers uh, the various legal aspects and allows people to do what they want in a copy left sort of way. So uh, you can derive designs from this. 
uh, and you can manufacture as many of these as you like and you can sell them and so on. Uh, but uh, if you want to change the design, you have to join the design group, which is really just a formalization of the normal software process. There are some people who know how this is all done uh, and uh, you know, they are uh, the geeks in charge of this project. And we can have as many balloon sub-projects as we like, uh, but because of the manufacturing requirements, there has to be a list of people. And that's how the current license works. Now, what I want is for anybody who actually is interested in this to tell me whether uh, that license is actually any use to them. Uh, I think there's a little bit too much formalism in it, but the principles are sound, and I'd very much like to have some feedback on it. Um, there's URLs on my link. That's it. Okay, it said um, not to use notebooks, so I'll skip the quick demo I had prepared. Um, probably I broke it anyway. Uh, hi, my name is Philip Kaluza. I'm not a Debian developer, but uh, someday I will be. And uh, I want to talk about Tracker. I'm not a Tracker developer either, but I think it's interesting. Uh, the title, uh, someone asked me that, refers to while I was writing this up, uh, I read a blog post, post and it talked about uh, something something being the best thing since sliced cheese. So to the people of the interweb, get your facts straight. Sliced cheese sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, why, why do I talk uh, about Tracker to you guys? Well, building a distribution is all about integration of different software, and I think uh, that Tracker is a good uh, way to do that, a uh, good opportunity. <coughs> uh, basically, Tracker started out as a desktop search engine, uh, similar to what Beagle is doing. Yeah, Beagle is a bit heavyweight for its purpose, I think. Uh, while I really like developing in C-sharp, I think uh, Beagle is, or a search engine is too central a part to write it in such a heavyweight language. Uh, Tracker also had a second mi mission, and that was uh, to be yeah, like a central store for all the, the metadata, metadata that happens on the desktop. So um, any data that uh, actually you could collect to a file, for example, uh, I downloaded from this and that URL at this, this and that time, or uh, possibly um, the link to this URL was sent to me by this and that uh, friend. Uh, that's the kind of metadata that um, I think is really interesting to collect that you don't, uh, cannot extract automatically well, you do know about the file creation time, uh, but actually finding out, uh, yeah, this um, this kind of metadata is, um, yeah, would need to be collected, is not collected nowadays. And uh, once you have that, I think uh, the computing experience might change for the better for most desktop users. Uh, this file searching is uh, especially targeted for the desktop, for, for usual documents that you handle not for system-wide files. And <clears throat> yeah, the, the architecture uh, works uh, r roughly like this. You have one daemon per user indexing the files that this user is interested in. So uh, mainly his home directory, uh, which also means that if you have a shared directory for documents or for, for sound or something, that uh, every user will index it himself. Um, there's not yet any provision for having a system-wide service doing this. This per-user daemon is started by Dbus automatically whenever it is um, needed, but it, it has a bit of startup overhead to see what what uh, stuff changed uh, while it, it wasn't running. Uh, so it makes sense to start this as early as possible in the session. And yeah, while, it's, while the daemon is running, it will watch with iNotify uh, what happens in, in your home directory or where, wherever. The whole thing is backed by SQLite database. You can uh, look at it directly, uh, but um, if you want to manipulate it, you should go through the Dbus interface to the, through the tracker daemon. And it has, has a, a separate word index uh, for full text searching. Um, 
This will includes, for example, PDFs that contain real text, uh, not scanned PDFs, of course. And uh, yeah, you can you can find your documents easily that way. <coughs> uh, Tracker is, is fast and uh, small. Um, I haven't done any memory measure measurements myself, but the last numbers I heard is that you should uh, that be able to keep it running with just six uh, megabyte of uh, memory used. And uh, yeah, as I said, it, it wants or aims to be uh, your one-stop shop for all the metadata. So um, especially interesting at the moment, I guess, are uh, keywords, sometimes also just called tags. Uh, many of the Web 2.0 applications allow users to just mark up your, uh, your files uh, simply with that. There's a patch uh, also floating around where you can um, replace the, uh, in GNOME, the Nautilus emblem mechanism with uh, keywords. So it shows the emblems on the files for, uh, for key keywords that have a de defined emblem. Um, that's what, what, that was what I wanted to demo. Uh, <coughs> also, of course, it can extract uh, keywords from PDFs and stuff if they are created properly. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so time's almost up. I'll skip the demo. Um, any application that you might be hacking on or maintaining and doing some, some more stuff on it, um, w what can your applications do? Uh, of course, it can search the metadata. Um, it can, uh, but there's centralized search tools also. It, it would be important to tell a tracker about metadata that you have and that can't be extracted automatically, like where did I download that, the file. And uh, yeah, hopefully that will in the long term lead to a, a nicer desktop integration and nicer user experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Pandora's technology box, followed by talking about Debian. Or not. <laughs> Talking about Debian? P Builder. Yep. It was in the schedule. debaday.debian.net Yay!
Okay, well, that crashed my laptop. Um, So I think we'll move swiftly on, while we try and get this sorted, to uh, conspiracy, dissent and FUD. <laughs> Which may be slightly longer than five minutes now. Yeah, since nobody's gone so far, <laughs> took one talk. Maybe I'll take a little extra time. Uh, so as many of you guys know, I'm from the US and from Seattle, uh, where Microsoft is from. Uh, so I thought I would come up with a conspiracy theory that would link these two. This is uh, la from last year at DevConf over uh, drinks. I came up with this ca crazy conspiracy theory, and uh, it was kind of used to describe some of the trollish behavior that's happened in Debian. So uh, pe some people told me I should turn it into a lightning talk this year, so I did. Uh, so this is somewhat funny and tangentially related to Debian, but uh, it's you know anyway. So. Uh, 1999, the European Parliament Directorate General for Research requested a report on the development of surveillance technology and the risk of abuse of economic information for political control. Uh, this was actually written by a guy from Edinburgh. Uh, and this report detailed the state of art in communications intelligence, which is also known as comment, um, basically the automated processing of intelligence uh, for purposes uh, basically targeted in communications intelligence activities by the U.S. government. Uh, and this was a report that followed uh, the Echelon technology that everybody knows about. Uh, two of the key findings of this report was that basically at the moment in 99, there are comprehensive systems that exist at the moment to access, intercept, and process every important modern form of communications that exist. Uh, and another one is that there's a wide ranging evidence, there is wide ra ranging evidence that indicates that major governments are routinely utilizing communications intelligence to provide commercial advantage to companies and trade. Um, this last part is particularly important to note because typically the targets of comment uh, operations are military or diplomatic communications like, or uh, like narcotics trafficking or money laundering, terrorism, that sort of thing. Uh, but since the 1960s, following uh, increase in world trade, the collection of economic intelligence has been sort of an increasingly important aspect of comment. Um, and it's clearly been demonstrated to be exploited to obtain economic advantage for the U.S. Uh, in fact, the U.S. officials acknowledge that the NSA collects economic information through these methods. Um, and these methods, or this information that's gathered, is used to produce Intelligent, in, intelligence of direct commercial benefit to companies like Boeing and um, I will posit Microsoft. So uh, in fact, in the 70s, the executive director of the US Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, uh, Intelligence Advi uh, Advisory Board mandated that from here on out, economic intelligence be considered a function of U the US national security interest, which is up there with uh, diplomatic military military and technological intelligence. Um, so if we take that and we combine that with the second part of this conspiracy theory that involves a little bit of US history uh, about a program that the FBI initiated in the 60s called uh, COINTELPRO. This is uh, something that Wikipedia defines as a, uh, a program that was used to or designed to investigate and disrupt dissident political organizations within the US uh, and particularly at targeted organizations which were considered to have politically radical elements, although the range was pretty broad, went from anti-war groups to uh, Martin Luther King's organization, that sort of thing. Um, basically how COINTELPRO worked was FBI agents uh, infiltrated organizations and exposed and disrupted, misdirected, discredited, and otherwise neutralized the activities of these movements. Uh, they used methods by basically uh, infiltrating and pretending to be part of the group and then they in increased factionalism and caused disruption uh, and, and defections within the group. So this, was, this program was secret until uh, the early 70s when a FBI office in Pennsylvania was uh, burglarized by a group of left-wing radicals who stole a bunch of uh, files from the FBI and then published them. And uh, basically 
the effect of this program is pretty widespread in the U.S. and caused a lot of uh, disruptions in organizations. Um, so, and the reason that the U.S. gave for this program, they said they dismantled it, but a lot of people think it still exists. But the reason they gave for this program was it was created uh, for the purposes of protecting the U.S. national security interests. Um, so let's turn to Microsoft here for a second, where Microsoft's profits are somewhere in the range of about $15 billion a year. Uh, that means daily net income is about $55 million. That's every 24 hours they make $55 million um, in pure profit. <laughs> uh, apparently it takes Microsoft about 10 hours of business uh, to exceed Red Hat's entire quarterly profits, about $20 million. So. Um, we also can combine this with uh, the report that was released in January uh, in um, the Washington Post about uh, Microsoft working with the NSA to include a backdoor and win key in Windows NT um, in order to have access or whatever. Uh, and as probably everybody knows, somewhere in NT4 Service Pack 5, Microsoft screwed up and forgot to uh, cover this information that and it was identified. And the NSA and Microsoft are pretty adamantly against, um, you know, asserting that this is for any purpose otherwise, other than like uh, something very innocuous. Um, but anyways, as I was discussing earlier um, about the comment interception capabilities report to the EU Parliament, one of the areas that the U.S. now considers important for protecting national security interests uh, includes economic interests. And if we take this information, combine it with the knowledge of the well-documented COINTELPRO program, we can sort of develop a conspiracy theory that uh, asserts the very viable possibility that the U.S. could, within reason, consider the free software movement uh, fairly revolutionary and, by extension, Debian itself, uh, and dangerous to the U.S. national security interests, and as a direct attack against the national security interests of the state of America. So. If we construct a thread between all these elements, we uh, get a fairly conspicuous picture that could lead you to conclude that the uh, free software projects, in Debian in particular, is likely infested with agent provocateurs, uh, well-paid technical professionals, uh, frequently contracted by the U.S. three-letter agencies, uh, and so it would be relatively trivial for a paid technical agent of one of the S uh, CIA or FBI or whatever to pass through the NMQ and permeate Debian's web of trust and slowly disrupt our inevitable progression towards total world domination uh, with free software and the erosion of uh, you know the various proprietary profits that companies like Microsoft have enjoyed over the years and uh, of course you know Microsoft's SCO patent licensing schemes that are coming out recently that are you know claiming open source vendors must respect Microsoft's intellectual property and uh, some of which they claim is Linux itself and Steve Ballmer's partnership with Novell and all that sort of stuff. Um, clearly, Microsoft considers Linux a threat. We all know that. And um, we sort of celebrate it with a certain amount of glee. Uh, but they are a significant economic part of the U.S. economy. And by extension, because of this, they, uh, this threat to Microsoft could be considered a threat against the U.S. government. So uh, if Microsoft's threatened by Linux, U.S. government is threatened by Linux, covert operations are undertaken to disrupt Linux, trolls appear on our mailing lists. <laughs> um, so, you know, we know Boeing, uh, for example, also a Seattle company, you know, n no coincidence there, uh, has engaged in actual activities such as this in the past. And Microsoft's past cooperation with the government on covert operations with this NSA key can lead one to sort of an inevitable, if not ridiculously crazy, conspiracy theory. So there you go. <laughs> oh, cool. Those slides were not mine. <laughs> Okay, so as you all know, we have about 15,000 packages in the archive. There's a lot of crap, but there's also a lot of little gems, which are, for most of them, totally unknown. So 
I'm part of the team behind Debian package of the day. You have a picture here of the website. So the goal is to the goal is to introduce uh, little gems that nobody knows about to our users. So you should <laughs> you should submit as entries because we don't write the entries; we just edit them. Uh, for example, this one. This was an, uh, an entry a few months ago about calculate. Who knows calculate? Okay, so all the others, it's a desktop calculator uh, with a GTK and a Qt interface. There are both two packages. It does unit conversion, which is quite convenient to think about current threads on Debian Devil. And we, are, we have quite a lot of readers. We, have, we are syndicated on Planet Ubuntu, on Debian Times, we are not syndicated in Planet Debian because of the no non-personal blogs policy. Uh, we got slash dotted in March. And the result is that when an entry gets published, the popcorn score of the package really increases. That's the popcorn score for calculate. The red line indicates <laughs> when it was published. <laughs> So really submit as entries about package you like, or package you package. You can also become an editor. Uh, Debo Day uh, on it with this current form exists since uh, de last de de December. We publish two entries per week. We currently have th three active editors. That's Anna, me, and Tincho. And we re really need someone else to help us. So if you Things that you can help us, yeah, just mail us and, and join. You don't need to, sp to write English very well, we don't, so. <laughs> but if you do, it's even better. Okay, that's all. I think, yeah. <laughs> oh, and since I have lots of time remaining, one of the first entries that were published on Day by Day was about WebSec, which is a cool package that allows you to monitor websites for changes. That is, you say that, for example, a personal home page of someone you want to follow, can just, it just mails you when that, that page changes. And this package is all found now. So if someone is interested in this, just adopt it. Okay, you've all heard the conspiracy, so I've got a solution. In fact, I'm quite sure that I met some of those trolls, <laughs> those flame war people <laughs> that have come from uh, somewhere in the United States by way of somewhere in Europe. <laughs> My talk is about the two commands of success. I see that many things in the world can be carried from one organization to another organization. And so if you look at the world to see what organization has been most successful, in my opinion, there's a fellow that came and they asked him, what are the two great commands? Or they asked him the first one, actually. And he said, the first one is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the second one is like, and the second one was, the first one was love him because he's one. The second one was love your neighbor as yourself. Unity was his number one command. He started out by saying, we're one. If any organization wants to be successful, unity is the first command. That's why the United States, as he documented, sent people in as spies to infiltrate the organization and cause dissent within the organizations. 
Because later on the Bible says where there is division, there is every evil work. And the last day that he was here on this earth, he spent sweating like drops of blood, praying that all his disciples might be one. And he said two times the reason was so that the world might know. So if Debian is going to be even more successful than the great success we've already enjoyed, the path to the greater success is going to be through greater unity within the organization. And I've used half of my time, and that's all I need to say. Thanks. Okay, I have like uh, two seconds to make my laptop work and make the worst light lighting dog ever because it's completely improvised to filling the gap. So I have basically no chance that it works, but let's see if that will work. It doesn't, okay, that's very fine. I had a good idea to improvise a talk, actually. Anyway, so this is about the Smith Review Project, also known as the worst announcement ever. <laughs> uh, actually, it happened on April 1st, 2007. Some guy, some random French guy, announced that he would launch a, re a project to review English in all of your templates, uh, control files, or whatever. So actually, nobody ever imagined that it was serious, and it was. <laughs> so basically, this lighting talk is meant to say you know, that this is a serious project. So this is basically on purpose than one of the guy that speak uh, the most awful English ever you have ever heard in a depth conf is just here to tell you because most of you also suck in English. <laughs> right, everybody agrees. So the point of the project is pretty obvious. It's meant to review the use of this wonderful language and make Debian the best English-speaking distribution ever. It's already the best Spanish-speaking, French-speaking, etc. <laughs> so we have to be the best English-speaking distribution ever. Um, the point of my slide was to give you a kind of wiki page or pointer or whatever to have all the native speakers of this beautiful language join us and replace me as the worst leader ever. Um, this is somewhere lost on the wiki.debian.org under i18n. So you just have to go around there and look for Smith because this stupid name was chosen also by me, which is a, yet another stupid announcement. Uh, initially, I, I wanted to use Cambridge, which sounds like more British, uh, British style. <laughs> Someone Someone very keen in both English and legalese stuff told me that Cambridge Dictionary is something that's non-free, so okay. So Smith is supposed to be an English dictionary, which was this name. The point is, whatever you have something, when, whenever you have something written in English, think about the mailing list, Debian-L10N-English, and ask for a review, please, and just, make us mad with a lot of work. And of course, native speakers, please join so that we can deal with that. So that was basically the point. And the very last, as I still have two minutes, and this morning I, w I was disappointed. I didn't have any at enough attendance to the Bhutan talk, so I wanted to say thank you to everybody and thank you to the DEPCONF organizers, but I wanted to say it in Zonka. So <laughs> the, my slide was supposed to explain you how to say thanks in Zonka, so we will 
do it together. So I will ask you to say Kudzu Tsangpo to all DEPCONF organizer, please. Louder. Kudzu Tsangpo. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Right. What was the first one I was going to be doing? Ah, yes, thank you very much. Um, I have been writing an article um, called Pandora's Technology Box. And um, I wanted to tell you about it. Now, you know what Pandora's Box is? It's the box that somebody opened. Um, and all of the world's illnesses came out of it. Um, when you apply that to technology, basically I, it means all of the things that when you open the box of, te of the technology and you sit in front of a computer, especially like us, for prolonged periods of time, it has an effect on you. We know this. <laughs> yeah. You get RSI from standing thing, that Microsoft student. I don't know if you've seen it, the photograph. The student is down like this with the laptop on the floor. Yeah? Now, how many people actually sit like that? How many people have you seen today sitting like that, bent over the laptop? Now, for how long? Oh, my neck. Oh, ah, thing. 50 hertz, 60 hertz screens. Flickering under 50 hertz light, causing um, interference patterns. We've got to look after ourselves, for goodness sake. And the reason is very simple. It's because technology is in our entire world, our first world, is now entirely dependent on technology. And that is a, in some ways for our health, that is a really bad thing. But it's also, it's necessary. Because if, from a communications perspective, the fact that we're able to communicate globally, to share information and, 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 and knowledge globally, and as, um, uh, as one person was pointing out, one of the boffs, you can now, you can create something in a, in a file, send it to somebody, and they will ship you a physical product. You have to send them money as well, but um, you can get a physical product back. So um, we, are we have an enormous amount of responsibility all right, to, keep, to keep ourselves healthy. All right? so I'm really the thing, it's, it's, and I've, I've, I'm both psychologically and physically. So please, please, please don't punish yourselves all right, with, with, the, with these, um, these uh, uh, rules, these social conventions. Oh, I'm, you know, all of my peers are drinking, or um, so I must. Um, my employment contract says that you know every all my intellectual property is, is owned. Therefore, I must, I, you know, I must sign it. You know, for goodness sake, um, stay in your integrity. All right, everybody here. All right, some of the talks that I've been to and people I've spoken to have been absolutely fantastic. All right. Um, it, it, the, you know, the emphasis on, 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 on things. I'm just so delighted to have been here to, to, to a sample and to opportunity to talk to people about things. That social, the, the social survey that, uh, thing that that guy was giving, uh, that they, they talk about his social survey. Um, uh, uh, speaking to Ian Jackson about um, getting um, some information about the fact that Debian is, you know, insight into Debian being basically a political organization. It, it is political. Everybody's political. Um, being in that guy's talk, that was fantastic boff you did. Um, uh, about the, um, um, you know, what, you know what's, what's the, our relationship to the ex external world and these, these things? What do one of people see from Debian? Um, the insights from that are, 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 are fantastic. Um, and every single one of us ha is here for a very, a, a very specific reason. All right? It's because we, 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 we believe in something and we're not going to give it up. All right? That's fantastic. It's, you know, the, um, there's that wonderful quote, the, uh, 
the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man adapts the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends upon the unreasonable man. Now, please be unreasonable. It's unreasonable as you'd like, all right? And enjoy it. Stay in your integrity, all right? And this man here, all right, this idea of the, the idea of unity, fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. A re really a, 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 a thing, yeah? Um, you don't have to believe in God. You just think, you know, if you spot something, do it. You know, if you think that it should be done, for goodness sake, do it. Don't wait for anybody else. All right, please don't wait for anybody else. All right, um, don't wait for any social conventions. But also at the same time, please look after your health. Look after yourselves. Enjoy your life. Enjoy doing what you're doing. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Morkin, for dredging the very bottom of the barrel and coming up with me <laughs> to talk. <laughs> so I'm going to give a lightning talk about uh, calendaring extensions for distributed authoring and versioning. Does anybody know what that is? CalDAV. So uh, last uh, DebConf, uh, one of the things that's been pissing me off about free software for the last 10 years is that something I used to do back in the early 90s when I was using Windows 3.1 was to share my calendars with other people and it's just something that I have not been able to do successfully with free software ever since really other than web based calendars that are there now yeah, it doesn't work so well on aeroplanes, but uh, then neither does Keldav, perhaps, although it can sync later. But uh, there are some uh, kind of light at the end of the tunnel with uh, Keldav and GroupDav and uh, the API for Google Calendar. Um, so I, l last uh, DebConf, I started working on writing a Keldav server and uh, it's pretty much kind of working now. Uh, so there's, there is a, an option there for people who want to have shared calendars to look at other calendars. And um, the, the way uh, WebDAV works and is supported by a lot of calendaring software is to write the entire calendar out as a file using DAV which, which is very prone to collisions. If you've got two people maintaining the same calendar, it will, you know, they'll easily collide. CalDAV uh, has a bunch of mechanisms around it that, um, that avoid those collisions, partly, to, uh, partly by um, simply writing individual events out rather than writing the whole calendar, and partly locking mechanisms and using e-tags. If you've ever looked at the RFC specifications, CalDAV is one of the, one of the uh, finest examples of standing on the shoulders of others that I've ever seen, but it makes it a bloody nightmare to read because it's built on top of HTTP 1.1, it's built on top of DAV, it's built on top of DAV permissions, and it's built on top of iCalendar, which is built in turn on top of other things. So. Uh, does anybody have any questions about CalDAV or anything like that? Anand. What's the URL? My, the URL for, for my server is rscds.sourceforge.net. Um, and rscds uh, 
It stands for the really simple Caldev store. It also stands for the Royal Scottish Country Dancing Society. So, <laughs> for a little bit of humour since we're in Edinburgh. And uh, any other questions? I, I know. Uh, I know. Apple recently released uh, their Caldev server under some license that at least OSI is happy with. Uh, it, it, probably the APSL or maybe something more permissive, um, more DFSG free. Uh, does anybody, uh, ha have, have you compared yours to theirs and how does it differ? Sure. I have, uh, I have tried the a Apple CalDev server. It's written in Python and it uses, um, it uses extended attributes in the file system to store the uh, metadata and it, it works uh, to some extent. Uh, it will crash evolution hard if you try and use it with evolution, but that's a bug in evolution, not a bug in Apple's CalDAV server. So uh, no doubt somebody could exploit that if they were security or anti-security minded. Um, but yeah, generally it's, it's okay. It probably goes further than my one does because mine's a solo effort and Apple's calendar server is the work of, of several people, including one of the authors of the CalDAV specification and other specifications related to CalDAV. But I'm having fun doing mine. Any other questions? I've only got one second left anyway, so <laughs> thank you for putting up with me. And